As we are all aware, there is growing concern about maternal sepsis in the contemporary obstetrics. This has occurred in part because of one or two very public cases in this country and which have been the subject of formal inquiries and a series of recommendations. It's also the case because of the recent triennial report in Britain which found that there had been an increase in the number of maternal deaths due to sepsis and that it is now the commonest cause of direct maternal death in Britain. I would draw to your attention, however, that this increase is due to an increase in the number of postpartum infections due to community-acquired group A streptococcus and not intrapartum or antenatal infections. The subject of maternal sepsis is extremely challenging for a number of reasons. There is problems about the terminology. People use phrases like maternal sepsis, obstetric sepsis, puerperal sepsis, maternal septicemia, maternal infection in ways that are ill-defined and are often used interchangeably. It's very hard to find any good, robust evidence on the incidence of infection during pregnancy. This is in part because there are variations in terms of preventative measures with antibiotics and vaccination. It depends on whether you're talking about a low risk or a high risk population. There are differences in diagnostic criteria, as we shall see. It depends on what health care resources are available to prevent and to treat infection. There is a very strong link between infection and pregnancy and obstetric interventions. It also depends on how good our coding systems are. Just because there is a low incidence of infection reported doesn't necessarily mean that there are good clinical practices. And finally, it depends on whether you're talking about community diagnosis or hospital diagnosis. With shortened bed stay, many women are now discharged home where the diagnosis of an infection is made and it's treated in the community without any reference to the hospital in which the woman was delivered. The forthcoming revised Australian-based um, diagnosis of sepsis, which is going to be introduced by the Department of Health for next year, highlights that sepsis is a clinical syndrome. It's not, as it used to be, synonymous with bacteremia. You need to have an infection and there needs to be evidence of a systemic inflammatory response. Sepsis can be either local or systemic. A blood culture may or may not be helpful. You may have a positive blood culture, but not sepsis. You may have sepsis, but a negative blood culture. The best classification of maternal infection, in my view, is infections specific to pregnancy, infections aggravated by pregnancy, and infections that are incidental to pregnancy. This is aligned with what I believe is the best classification of critical illnesses in pregnancy, full stop, but it's also closely aligned with the WHO classification of maternal mortality into direct, indirect, and incidental deaths. I have identified five pregnancy-specific infections. Chorioamniasis, endometritis, perineal infections, wound infections, and lactational mastitis. Any of these infections may progress to bacteremia or to sepsis. There are two distinct groups. There is chorioamniasis and endometritis. These are extremely challenging diagnoses. On the one hand, the diagnosis may be obvious and florid. 
On the other hand, the diagnosis may be extremely subtle. It's challenging for us because the site of infection is not visible. Microbiological access is difficult and in many cases not feasible. The microbiology may be completely unhelpful. The organism that you identify in the vaginal swab may not be the organism that's responsible for the infection. And indeed, there may be any, many organisms that are responsible for the infection. The placental bed is highly vascular and is vulnerable to bacteremia. So we can move from a situation where you have chorioamniasis to bacteremia or sepsis very quickly. It's strongly associated with cervical dilatation and prolonged rupture of the membranes where the amniotic sac is ruptured. And therefore, the physical barriers to infection are taken down. Thus, it is strongly associated with the peripartum period. If the amniotic sac ruptures, you get oligohydramnias. Normally, we would expect that if you give an antibiotic, that it goes into the liquor and therefore gives you some protection at tissue level. If there's oligohydramnias, the tissue levels of the antibiotic are reduced. And then finally, there is the challenge antenatally of picking the optimum time to deliver the baby. And postnatally, there's the challenge of deciding when and how you need to carry out an evacuation of the retained products of conception. The second group are much easier to deal with. First of all, it's associated with pain and discharge. And the mother can easily localize for us where the infection is. On inspection, we see erythema and swelling. The diagnosis can usually be made early and microbiological cultures are feasible. If the treatment is appropriate, sepsis or bacteremia is rare. Usually, by the time you come to make the diagnosis, the physiological changes of pregnancy have started to resolve. The choice of antibiotics is easier, and we don't need to be concerned about the effect of antibiotics on the fetus unless the woman is breastfeeding. These infections are often diagnosed and treated in the community. There are also pregnancy non-specific infections. These can be related to increased susceptibility, increased severity, and then they may be more likely to occur because sometimes we as doctors are hesitant with vaccination or treatment. And then finally, there is the whole issue of emerging organisms, and an example of that would be Ebola. There are major challenges when it comes to the early diagnosis and treatment of infection in pregnancy. The first challenge are the physiological changes in pregnancy, which start to occur very early on. The heart rate increases by 15 to 20 minutes per minute by the third trimester. The diastonic blood pressure decreases in the middle of pregnancy. And the respiratory rate increases by one to two per minute. There is a physiological leukocytosis primarily due to an increase in neutrophils. And this leukocytosis increases further in labor and it increases as labor progresses. And therefore, we must be aware of that when we go to interpret the white cell count. We know that one of the most, I suppose, remarkable miracles of pregnancy, that a baby where the genetic makeup is 50% of the father's genetic makeup, is not rejected immunologically during the course of pregnancy. In the past, we talked about immune suppression. But now we know it's much more subtle than that. 
and that you get its immune modulation. One of the biomarkers that we use for the early diagnosis of infection, C-reactive protein, increases physiologically during pregnancy because pregnancy is a low-grade inflammatory state. In patients who are obese or who smoke, this increase may be, for, may be more exaggerated. There are profound changes in renal function. In particular, there's an increase in glomerular filtration rate, which is particularly important when it comes to the drug gentamicin. This is one of the potent bactericidal antibiotics that we use, but we are more likely to underdose during pregnancy than we are outside of pregnancy. There's a decrease in serum creatinine, which makes it more difficult to interpret organ damage during the course of pregnancy. There's very little in the literature for obvious reasons about the pharmacokinetics of antibiotics during pregnancy, but they do change. If you look at this for amoxicillin, we need to use higher doses of amoxicillin during pregnancy to get the same levels at tissue level. We have to remember that unlike any other group of physicians, we have to look after two patients at the same time. In the first trimester, there are issues around teratogenicity. Later in pregnancy, there is the whole complex decision-making that goes around making the optimum time for delivering preterm in the presence of spontaneous rupture of the membranes. Pregnancy is different from other times in a woman's life because normally the intrauterine cavity is sterile. During pregnancy, that sterile cavity is exposed to the vaginal flora in a way that it isn't at other times. One of the issues that has arisen over the last few years is the early diagnosis of critical illnesses in general, but infection in particular. There have been numerous reports advising that we should introduce early warning scores outside of pregnancy and modified obstetric early warning scores during pregnancy. And one of the projects that we have been working with over the last few years with the Division of Nursing and Midwifery is the introduction of the IMUs, the Irish Maternity Early Warning System. When we reviewed the situation, what we found was the recordings of the maternal vital signs were dispersed throughout the maternity records. This made it very difficult to trend the vital signs. In many cases, the measurements of the vital signs were not simultaneous. There was the potential for omissions. The respiratory rate was not recorded, and the respiratory rate is particularly important for the early diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and sepsis. There was a lack of standardization of early warning systems throughout the country. They were only present in 10 out of 19 units. Many of the charts omitted vital pieces of information. And the use of these charts has never been audited or validated clinically, not only in this country, but internationally. This is why, as many of you know, in April of 2013, we introduced the IMUSE chart. Ireland is the first country in the world to standardize its early warning systems, both in terms of recordings, the charts, and the escalation criteria. We have audited its introduction. We have found that the recordings are now consolidated in the one place in the record. The trends are now obvious to the medical staff. The measurements are being taken contemporaneously and omissions are now obvious.
there has been a significant improvement in the reporting of the vital signs and in particular there's been a significant improvement of the respiratory rate. There is a national audit which has been conducted this summer in eight of the 19 units and these audits are still in draft form. Internationally, there have been concerns about mortality rates in adults from sepsis. In response, there has been a surviving sepsis campaign amongst experts internationally. The first guideline has been produced in 2004 and that has recently been updated. As part of the ministerial directive, we are expecting in November of this year that we will have a national guideline on sepsis for the non-pregnant adult. Sepsis has been defined as a system, systemic inflammatory response due to confirmed or suspected infection. When you look at the 100-page documents that have been produced by the surviving sepsis campaign, there are definitions that have been agreed for sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. There's about 20 pages that give special consideration for pediatric patients because of the physiological changes that occur in children. Interestingly, no consideration has been given in the document to pregnancy. And there are no agreed criteria for SIRS in pregnancy. On the left-hand side of the column you here, you can see from the National Early Warning System what are the criteria that are put in the sepsis 6 box for the non-pregnant patient, the gynecological patient. What we have done is based on our review of the literature and the work of Patrick McGuire and Karen Power is that we have customized the vital signs for pregnancy to make allowance for the physiological changes of pregnancy. We have in decreased the respiratory rate, we have increased the heart rate, and we have increased the white cell count. If we stayed with the previous criteria, a woman who had a urinary tract infection, a heart rate of 95 beats per minute, and a white cell count of 14, would have been diagnosed as having sepsis based on the non-pregnant criteria. We have now introduced this sepsis 6 box onto the IMUSE chart and our plan is to audit its use over the next 12 months. I believe we may have to further modify the criteria in the light of the evidence that accumulates over the next couple of years. But again, Ireland is the first country to introduce a standardized, modified criteria for the sepsis 6 box in the pregnant patient. On the right-hand side, you can see that again, this is based on the sepsis 6 box for the non-pregnant adult. And it sets out the three things that the doctor has to take and the three things that the doctor has to give. The cornerstone is the early administration in the right dose of bactericidal, in most cases, antibiotics. Unlike the non-pregnant patient, we need to take particular care with IV fluid bolus because of patients um, having preeclampsia. I thought I'd just briefly share with you some results from a study that we've published in the International Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology from the COOM this year, in part because there is a paucity of high quality information about infection in pregnancy. We picked bacteremia because it is a very robust 
definition when it comes to infection because it's serious and because it's topical. We found that there were 58 cases over five years, an incidence of 0.15%. To put that in context, that is half the incidence of a recent study published from five academic hospitals in Paris, and we all believe that the French have a good healthcare system. Thankfully, there were no maternal deaths. Only two women developed septic shock, and they were discharged home alive and well a week afterwards. Four women had early pregnancy loss, and two women had a stillbirth. In many cases, the fetal demise preceded the development of infection. They could be broken up into three groups. One third developed the bacteremia antepartum, which was usually the secondary to the urinary tract, and the commonest organism was E. coli. One third were intrapartum, again the source was the genital tract, and the commonest organism was group B strep. And the other third were postpartum, the origin being the genital tract, and the most common organism being E. coli. Interesting, when we looked at the place of birth of the patients, we found the patients who were from, originally from Africa and Asia were four times more likely to develop bacteremia. When we went through the charts, this had nothing got to do with access. It had nothing got to do with communications. So please don't go away from today's talk and waste money bringing in additional translators. What we need is more money on frontline staff. The reason for the increase in African and Asian patients is because they have different organisms and they are less likely to be vaccinated. In summary, the incidence of maternal bacteremia in our hospital was low. Severe sepsis was rare. Contrary to what the general public are sometimes led to believe, the clinical outcomes are usually good. There is an increase in women who come from outside the European Union, and therefore we as clinicians need to be more vigilant when these patients arrive in our hospital. In a national review of sepsis in Britain, only 61% of cases were confirmed in the laboratory. The commonest source was the genital tract, and the commonest organism was E. coli. This is a large study that has been recently published from the United States looking at maternal, mort looking at maternal mortality from severe sepsis. It's interesting that the odds ratio is particularly high for rescue cerclage and for prophylactic cerclage. And we are seeing more and more cases of cerclage being performed in our hospitals. One of the common themes when you look at the relationship between infection in women and pregnancy is the strong association with the breach in the woman's physical integrity. It is strongly linked with obstetric interventions. And therefore, when we intervene, we must know that we are increasing the risk of this woman getting an infection. This might give us pause for thought when it comes to undertaking the intervention in the first place, but it also should give us pause for thought as to what we can do to prevent her getting infection, including administering prophylactic antibiotics. Again, it's interesting, the association with African-American women, which is also true um, when you look at the WHO analysis of maternal mortality. So this increase in African and Asian women
is not something that's peculiar to Ireland. It is a worldwide phenomenon. So to just summarize briefly, the development of maternal sepsis in Ireland is strongly associated with ascending genital infection. We need to have constant vigilance. And that's why the introduction of the Irish Maternal Early Warning System is so important in terms of early diagnosis. It is important to remember antenatally that we have two patients and that the diagnosis of infection carries implications for both of them and that we should monitor the second patient and sometimes a fetal tachycardia may be a very early and subtle sign of chorioamnitis. We need to take particular caution in the antenatal and postnatal wards. In the labor ward, we monitor the patient very frequently. We have one-to-one -one midwifery. We have frequent medical rounds. Everybody has an expectation that something could go suddenly wrong. In the postnatal wards, there's usually been a successful pregnancy outcome. In terms of midwifery, the ward is often understaffed. We have infrequent rounds, and there is often little expectation that something could go badly wrong. That, in my view, is where we are most vulnerable in our hospitals at the moment. Finally, I would like to emphasize that the IMUs and the sepsis sock, six box are not a replacement for clinical judgment. They are there to support clinical judgment. That's why we've called it a system and not a score. It would be a mistake for us to start treating scores. We have to continue to treat patients. If something goes wrong, it is important to escalate that problem to the medical team early. And if things need to be done, it needs to be done quickly and it needs to be done decisively. Patients should receive high doses, appropriate antibiotics quickly. There has been an emphasis over the last 12 months on the early diagnosis and effective treatment of maternal sepsis. This issue is bigger than that in my view. This issue is about making the diagnosis of maternal infection early and preventing that infection going on to sepsis or to bacteremia. Finally, I would like to share something personal with you. The young baby in this photograph is my late father, Michael Turner. With his parents, Michael Turner and my grandmother, Winifred. This photograph was taken in 1922 in the United States of America, the year of the birth of the Irish Free State. Subsequently, my grandparents went on to have another boy, and in 1927, their first daughter. They were originally from Galway. They were in New York. They were living the American dream. Three weeks after my mother or my grandmother gave birth to her daughter, she died in New York from maternal sepsis. I know at first hand the impact that the death of a young mother can have on her family in another country. And I know the impact that the death of a young mother from sepsis can have on a family and how can that reverberate through the family. One of the outcomes that I want from today is for each and every one of you to go away from this meeting and to renew your efforts to prevent maternal infection and to prevent deaths from maternal sepsis in our hospitals. Thank you very much. Thank you.